In these next three short segments, we're going to talk about a, an organizational structure that we use in music, and that is called the genre. That's G-E-N-R-E. -E. Again, another one of those French words for us. So let's put it in a context that might be familiar to you. So you've probably taken endless English classes during your life, and in those English classes, you studied lots of different kinds of writing. So you might have studied short stories, you, list, you read some novels, poetry, autobiography, biography, um, I don't know, pick one. Anyway, all those different structures, they're all literature. We recognize them all as being writing. They have a kind of common structure. They use words, they use sentences. And those things, all those different varieties of literature are what we would call genres of literature. So we're gonna be talking now about genres in music. These are ways that we identify types of pieces that kind of give you, an, as, as an audience member, um, some basic understanding about what the piece should be like before you start. So we'll be doing three short segments. The first, we'll, we'll talk about instrumental music and the kinds of genres you might encounter there. Then we're going to talk about uh, vocal music, and then we'll talk about keyboard music. Each has its own set of vocabulary, and it's important to keep them separate because, again, trying to be smart at the concert, you don't want to go to a vocal concert and say, boy, wasn't that a great symphony, because a choir is not ever going to do a symphony. So let's start with those instrumental genres now. As I said, symphony, that's something choirs don't do. That is purely an instrumental genre. It's a term that gets confusing for people because we use it also to describe the group that plays a symphony. So you could say, I went to see the symphony last night and I heard the symphony play a symphony last night. So that's kind of confusing for some people. But when we're talking about the genre symphony, we're talking about a very specific kind of structure. It starts in uh, roughly around the 1700s. And when we talk about our periods in more detail, you'll, get, you'll know more about that. But basically it's a work for an orchestra and that orchestra has changed over time from being a fairly small group at the very beginning to literally could be a hundred people on the stage now. But mostly it's a, a work that has four movements. Remember we've talked about those as being separate segments of a piece of music that are sort of independent like chapters of a book. So in a symphony we would normally have four movements and the first one's going to have a very particular structure that we'll study later. The second movement's probably going to be something slow for a nice contrast because the first one will be fast. The third one will be a sort of medium tempo type of piece, and we'll study these in great detail later because this is a really important structure. And then the last movement is usually something fast because we kind of like to end things lively. So four movements, fast, slow, sort of medium, and then again, fast. Those together form the unit that we call a symphony. And again, it's usually played by a symphony. But you might actually go to a band concert, like a wind ensemble concert, and they might play something called symphony for band, in which case you should expect the same basic structure, but with a different instrumentation. So that's really kind of the grand, big, monstrous uh, genre for instrumentalists. Let's get a little smaller now. A concerto. So a concerto has an orchestra and they are basically the supporting cast for this because the star of a concerto is the soloist. So you might have, let's just say, we're gonna have a flute concerto. So that means that there's gonna be a flute soloist, orchestra accompanying. Could be a piano, uh, piano concerto, could be a tuba concerto. One instrument is usually going to be the star. There are some instances where they use two instruments. I, there, there's a really lovely vi violin viola duo concerto, so we'd have two soloists. But when you went to see that, you would have your orchestra and the soloist would come out. They'd be in the front. They usually have their music memorized, which the orchestra won't, but they will have their music usually memorized. And they're obviously the stars. So that's a concerto. That's pretty much a um, 1800s, late 1700s invention, and we still have those today. It's a very popular way of showcasing a particular performer. Before we really got into the whole solo concerto idea, we had a different kind of concerto called the concerto grosso, which means big concerto, but it only is big in relative terms to what happened before it, so it's not big compared to well, the modern concerto. So concerto grosso is more like a small orchestra and a small group of soloists. So you might have um, maybe four string players who are your solo group, 
and then you've got the orchestra. And they sort of alternate back and forth. That's a very standard practice in the whole concerto uh, structure. So we would have the entire orchestra play, and then we would focus on that smaller group in the concerto grosso. Both the concerto and the concerto grosso have multiple movements. Not as many as a symphony, though. Usually a concerto has a fast movement, a slow movement, and then another fast movement. So um, it has an opportunity for the soloist to shine in each of those movements. And in most of those concerti, such as the plural for concerto, you would also have a place where the whole orchestra would stop playing and the soloist just goes off and dazzles you with their brilliance as a performer. And we call that section the cadenza. It's really easy to tell because a, a really good cadenza is going to last a little while. So the whole orchestra is going to put their instruments down and watch attentively and wait till they get their magic cue that, oh, they're finishing that cadenza, which is usually, da. we get a little trill. Usually that's a, sort of our standard hey, my cadenza's over, and the conductor knows where it's supposed to be, and then the whole orchestra comes back in and finishes it together. So you only hear cadenzas in concerto for the most part. All right, so now let's go smaller. Back before we got into concertos and symphonies and these really big kinds of genres, we had some smaller ones. A very popular one in the Baroque period, which is the 1600s, was called the Suite. And a suite is a word we still use. Uh, if you ever look at furniture ads, they, will, they might say, you know, we have a bedroom suite. Although in America, we usually call that a bedroom suit. We just don't say it correctly. It is a suite of furniture, which means it's a set. So a bedroom suite would have a bed, a couple of nightstands, a dresser, the, the parts of furniture you would have. So if you think about that suite of furniture, now we're gonna apply that to music. But instead of having pieces of furniture, what we're going to have are dances. Now these are not dances like you would think of. You know, there's no line dance suite that I know of, although that would be a great idea for somebody to do. But this is happening back in the Baroque days when there were some very standardized types of dances that most people who were reasonably cultured knew how to do. So a composer would take those types of dances and they usually have names like Allemand, which means German, which tells you it's a German style dance, or Courant, or Sarabande, or some kind of term that to us sounds like, okay, whatever that is. But to people in that time, they knew what kind of dance that was. They expected certain rhythmic patterns, certain um, tempos were associated with those. So a composer could take several of those little dances, put them together in a set, like a set of furniture, and they would all be performed together as a suite. So each dance would be a movement. And you see that very much in the Baroque period and, and into the classical period. Once we get into later times, what we tend to see as a suite is where a composer has written something big like a ballet. You know, a ballet's probably got 30 or 40 different movements in it. And most of them are really short. Well, composers, you know, they want to get their money where they can get their money. So the only time that music ever gets played is if you do the whole ballet, which doesn't happen all that much. It's a big production, it's very expensive. So I'm the composer, I can make a little bit more money by taking the best of those movements from my ballet, the ones I like the best, and making a suite out of them. So I might pick, you know, we'll use the Nutcracker, everybody knows that one. So in the Nutcracker we might use the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, uh, maybe the Russian dance from um, the part where they have all the different kind of ethnic dances, um, the Waltz of the Flowers. Put them all together, and now I have something I can sell to orchestras. They can play just those selections, and we would say that's the suite from the Nutcracker. It's an important thing to remember when you're looking at concert announcements that says, okay, they're doing the Nutcracker. Well, you know, take a close look, because it's just the orchestra. They're not doing the Nutcracker. The Nutcracker has dancers. They're probably just doing a suite from it, and that's okay, but you'd be disappointed if you went and thinking you were going to see some dancers. So that's a suite. Let's look at um, things that sort of connect to other things now. And a lot of big works like opera, opera ballet, um, musical theater even, before the whole show starts, there's usually some sort of instrumental piece that starts the show out. And, you know, it's, people are generally milling around by then, but you're supposed to start being still then. That's actually part of the performance. We call that music that happens before the big show the overture. In the old days, the overture might have nothing at all to do with the music you were going to hear in the production itself. So it would be just a lovely piece of music 
that would get you ready for the show. So if it was going to be a deeply tragic show, then you might expect that the overture would be in that kind of mood. If it's comedy, you should expect a lighter kind of overture. As we get later in time, we see that composers would actually take bits of pieces that might actually be in the production and incorporate those into an overture. So if you think about your favorite musical and you, the music that they play at the beginning of that, even in the movie, it's usually made up of different tunes from the musical. So they've taken them together, made an overture. But in the old days, that's not how it was done. It was just a, a separate kind of piece. So the overture happens, and then the actual performance of the opera or ballet occurs. Then we have another kind of overture that we call a concert overture. So that tells us it's not attached to anything else. There's not going to be anything after it. It's, in other words, it's not an overture to anything. It's just a piece that we're going to call that. And basically, a concert overture is a one movement piece, and usually it has some sort of um, theme or story it's trying to tell in that piece of music. Famous example is Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture, which has music that relates to the War of 1812. So he's not really trying to give us a battle-by-battle -battle depiction of the War of 1812 in this piece of music, but he wants to suggest the idea of the War of 1812. So he's incorporated things like um, Russian folk songs. He's got the French national anthem in there. So he's brought in music from the parties that were part of the war, made this piece of music that gives you the sense of the War of 1812 without it actually being depictive of it or being at, um, there's nothing going on the stage that would say, oh yeah, that's what's happening here. It leaves a lot to your imagination, which is wonderful. Um, but freestanding piece, there's one about Hamlet, there's one about um, Don Juan. So it was pretty common in the 19th century to take famous literary or historical things and make a concert overture that would describe those. I thought let's look at a, a genre that's also the name of a group, like the symphony. We said that was kind of confusing. Here's another one, the string quartet. So a string quartet is an ensemble. It's four string players. We'll talk about what those are in the section on um, ensembles. But it's also the type of piece that a string quartet plays. So string quartets play string quartets. That's kind of a duh thing for music, but you know, we have a lot of duhs in music. String quartets play string quartets. A string quartet usually has four movements organized almost exactly like a symphony. Something fast, something slow, something medium, something fast. So once you've learned about that structure, which is called the sonata cycle, and we'll talk about that a lot later, then you'll be all set to know about symphonies, sonata, and string quartet because they all use that same structure. Then there are lots of other things that you could have for genres for instrumental music, but they're not the big ones. We've sort of talked about the big ones. Some other ones you might encounter might be a fugue which is a term that sort of goes out of favor after the early 1700s, but you might think of it as a sort of round, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about Baroque music. Uh, Fantasia is another term you might see, which is really a piece that's just supposed to sound sort of improvisational, like you were making it up as you went along. Obviously, the composer wasn't, because they've written all the notes down, but it's supposed to give the impression of, oh, I'm just having a lovely time, just, I like these themes, I'm going to play them and make a lovely piece of music out of it. So, those are the primary instrumental genres. Now let's take a look at what vocalists might do.